Welcome to Vancouver's first and only unapologetically progressive public affairs program with your hosts, David Benedictus and Daria Ruggles. Good morning, this is David Benedictus. Uh, welcome back to Cool Cove. Hello, I'm Daria Ruggles. Welcome back. And we have with us today uh, Bradley Richardson, who is the director of the Clark County Historical Society. Uh, the last uh, five five years, Bradley? Uh, this will be my fourth year as director. Fourth year, fourth year. okay. Yep. Yeah, fourth. Uh, so we're just going to roam around in the Historical Society today and find out what's cool about the Historical Society and opportunities people have to uh, engage there, um, including volunteering or whatever, or just to see cool stuff. So, um, so tell us how you became director of the Historical Society. Oh wow! So, so it, it's a it's a bit of a story. Uh, <laughs> so, go all the way back to 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, I basically was going back to school at WCU Vancouver after a, probably about a six year gap in my education. I, I went to Clark College. I got my associate's degree, and that was where I uh, met my my partner, uh, Katie. Um, and we ended up getting married around that time soon after we we met. And when she met me, I was I was working three jobs. I was at UPS, Burger King, and working in the Language Center, because uh, that's what you do when you're in college. And as soon as I graduated with my associates, uh, she ended up going to nursing school. And so I ended up working a whole nother career for a telecommunications company in the corporate office until 2010. And she said, uh, at that point, you know, you should really go back and do something you enjoy, find something you love, go back to school, get a bachelor's. And she really supported me in that. So uh, it was around 2008, uh, nine times. So I got laid off. <laughs> so perfect timing, you know, good go recession. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so in 2010, I'd finally been accepted to WC Vancouver and started in the history program. And it was in one of my first classes with Sue Peabody, who's an amazing professor up there, um, that she uh, you know, notified everyone of this opportunity to volunteer for Harvest Fun Day, uh, which was an event that was done by the Clark County Historical Museum. So I went there and I worked a whole day helping in the Scarecrow booth, which is uh, a pretty intense moment if anyone ever went to Harvest Fun Day. Because, uh, you know, if you don't have that right type of shirt or pants for that person that wants to build a Scarecrow, uh, you know, it's a tough conversation. <laughs> uh, so ways, I did that and then I came back after that. And Susan, who was the director at the time, Susan Tissot, uh, was, was pretty pleased that I decided to return after that volunteering experience. And I was an intern at the museum for an entire year. So every Friday and every Saturday, I came in for class credit, no, no wages or anything, and, and worked, uh, you know, all the way from helping pick up garbage to enter stuff in the spreadsheet. And I was just getting my history chops um, kind of taught to me at that time. And then eventually, uh, I started doing walking tours for the museum that same year, and I started helping with some exhibits. And at the end of the year, Susan offered me a job share position uh, as the visitor services coordinator assistant. Uh, and so then I ended up being in that position for a while. And as I finished my degree at WSU, I transitioned to a public history degree at Portland State University. Uh, and through that time, I ended up moving into a new position that Susan made, which was called the Museum Experience Coordinator, which is completely made up. It's not a real title. Nobody else has ever had that in the history of museums, as far as I'm aware. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ended up doing, you know, kind of more like program stuff, helping out with some more collections things, really heavy curation of exhibits, working with the writers or uh, collections person to help put together the exhibits. Eventually, I got my master's degree in public history, and then I was made the curator, which then I fully transitioned into just exhibits and collections management, while another staff member ended up taking over programs and events and more of the, the front-facing um, items. And then in 2017, I actually had left for a couple months, um, and I was working a different job, and the director position opened up here and I said, you know, I, my heart was always with the museum and obviously my degree was in history. So I, I applied at the, the young age of 35 uh, <laughs> to be the director with min minimal fundraising experience. Um, mm. And I just sat down and, and, you know, and I just said to him, you know, I think we have a lot of opportunity to just be a very community focused facilitator of history. And they seemed to like what I had to say. So I was offered the job and since 2017, I've had the, the opportunity to 
to be uh, you know, the leader of the organization and work with amazing people in the community to really tell our community story on our community's own terms. That's so lovely, Brad. And you, I mean, you really, obviously you, you earned this and um, that's that. And I remember doing one of the haunted walking tours with you. It was delightful. So tell us a little bit about what people might expect. I mean, why should people come to the Clark County Historical Museum? What are the interesting and fascinating things that you are doing right so, now? So, you know, coming to the museum is just one part of all the things that you can do when you engage with the museum. But if you came into the museum, you know, you paid that admission to come in and take a look at things, you would find four different galleries with four exhibits that we put up basically within the last kind of two years to, to the last year. Uh, the first exhibit that we, we talk about is the um, brewing exhibit which is in connection with the 100th anniversary of Prohibition. So this was pretty interesting because we actually were able to open it 100 years to the day wow. that Prohibition started in the United States. Um, so it was, you know, it was January 17th, 1920, and we opened it on January 17th, 2020. It just happened 100 years uh, away was a Friday too, which was really convenient. Uh, and in that one, it was really interesting. We we're able to explore all the way from the early European style brewing that came with the Hudson's Bay Company, uh -huh. which could be seen as kind of the start of brewing um, in, in the Pacific Northwest. And then we transitioned quickly over to kind of what was the impact of alcohol at the Vancouver Barracks, which is kind of a sordid story uh, mm -hmm. and definitely didn't give Vancouver necessarily the best reputation right off the bat with some of the military brass um, because there was a lot of uh, drinking in town uh, that the soldiers <laughs> were attracted to. <laughs> and uh, so then that behavior that, ensued. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't it wasn't really uh, looked at too great. Uh, <laughs> and so then from there we go into really the establishment of you know, the more uh, formal brewing industry, which started with Henry, w or well, started with uh, a guy named uh, Munch, and then eventually Henry Weinhart, and then Anton Young, and you had it go from the Vancouver Brewery to the Star Brewery, then you had, you know, Prohibition, and then eventually Lucky Lager, you have the rise of Great Western Malting, and then what we always do in the exhibits is we want to tie that thread all the way from you know, here's the start of the story, mm -hmm. and then here's what's happening today. And so we actually, it was called our contemporary panel. And so that panel basically is just becomes a list. So it's just like this brewery started in 2013, and this brewery started in 2014, and this brewery started in 20. So then we represent all of the breweries that started all the way up until the point in which we launched that exhibit. And in that one, we like to we like to build interactives and kind of have some fun out of the box stuff that we do. And so we built a bar in that exhibit and it has a whole display of contemporary can art from our local breweries ah. so that you get that continuity of like well here's the expression of all this history that you just read well here it is and represented it in this amazing art from our craft brewing industry so that's that's one of the exhibits that you can explore um then if you go to our next gallery which we call our hidden brick gallery uh which is kind of funny to us because actually the majority of the brick in the room is from Ridgefield and it's not hidden, but the back wall is. <laughs> uh, so we, you know, we tie it to that back wall mostly, but that's a women's history exhibit. And that was really incredible because just like with the brewing exhibit, we reached out to stakeholders and a really key stakeholder was the League of Women Voters of Clark County. Huh. They were hugely supportive and helpful. It was members of the league that actually helped write and edit and research and do this exhibit. So it really was a ground up community effort working, you know, discussing, talking about the historical points saying, you know, what does this evidence mean? And what does that evidence mean? And what's even more incredible is that we had had that exhibit planned for about four years to do this in conjunction with the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment and have this really sprawling women's history exhibit all the way from women, Native American nations, you know, women involved in, in the nations to women who represent us. And over that three years, you know, we're planning and getting ready and prepping. And when it's about go time to really start writing and implementing, well, a pandemic creeps in. And we had to end up doing most of it over over zoom and at distance like it, maybe two of us are in a gallery sitting six feet away from each other with masks and it was it was the most interesting but also most difficult experience and we 
said when we planned this out years before, hey, we're going to open this in you know August of 2020. This is going to happen. And so holding to our word, we did. And we opened it to an empty gallery uh, with no one who was able to come in. But as we've opened back up, people have started to come in and see this. And it's been an incredible experience. But it was just very trying to try to put together an exhibit. And, you know, doing that, we walk through the gallery now and we say, oh, well, you know, well, this date, uh, we need to fix this. <laughs> we like, let me go, oh, this sentence, well, we did this under prep. Let's correct. And, and we look at our first time that we put an exhibit out as kind of a first draft because we have people from the community come in and they say, well, you know, this is what I know and here's some evidence. And then they bring something new to us or, you know, we had a, a local historian who's a military historian come in and he like pointed this date the other day and he's like, oh, 1844 is too early for this. Like, let me, let me show you the records that I have. And I said, great, that's awesome. And we actually build our panels in design to be able to be amended so awesome. that we can correct if we, you know, get a date that's not totally accurate or if there's a sentence that we have a debate over whether, you know, it's truly representing the honest story based on, you know, community professionals, local historians, or other people we have feedback with, and we responded, and we're welcoming of that, because, you know, we did the best work we could, and then if new evidence is brought in, we want to change that, so that women's history exhibit is a good example of that, because we did it under extreme pressure, but I do have to say uh, that it is uh, been awarded the 2021 uh, Award of Excellence from the Washington State Historic, or Washington State uh, Museum Association, so, Congratulations. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Can people come in right now, Brad? They can. Yeah. We are open uh, Thursday through Saturday, 11 to 4, uh, every single week. Uh, and then we have two other exhibits uh, in the museum that they can see. Another one is the 2020 winner of the Washington Museum S Association Award of Excellence, which is our music exhibit which again, explores all the way from Native American nations through contemporary musicians. Uh, and it's just, it's a fun exhibit. And again, we worked with uh, Chinook and Cowlitz on the Native American nations portion. We worked mm -hmm. with military veterans on the part that talks about Vancouver Barracks and, and that band. We connected with other community museums such as Two Rivers Heritage Museum, La Center and North Clark to talk about the community music section. Uh, we worked directly with the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra on their panel because they turned 40, mm -hmm. I believe it was 40 in that year. Uh, we worked with local musicians of note like Amber Sweeney, who actually just recently played her farewell concert here in Clark County uh, on the you know famous individuals or musicians that have went places in the community. Uh, so again, lots of connectivity. And then the last exhibit is uh, an exhibit that we felt really compelled to do. I think you might have noticed on uh, kind of the river, some buildings popping up and some stuff <laughs> happening just a little bit. Uh, something so, going on there, yeah. What? Yeah, yeah. You just, it's just a couple shops and stuff. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, we thought it was really important to give some context to the waterfront and to the river and that history. And so that one is called Currents of Progress. And we explore rivers, oh. roads, and ports of Clark County. Uh -huh. And really, we go all the way from, you know, the ferries that were established by the European um, people coming out all the way through our contemporary and future developments on the waterfront, such as Terminal 1, Parker's Landing, um, Miller's Landing, and then also continuing to connect with Cathapodal Plank House and how that's evolving over time. So that's kind of what you would come in for the exhibit piece. And then if you're a person who wants to dig in and try to gather some stories of Clark County history, we have a research library and it's pretty robust and it's not just in the building. We also have knowledge of digital assets. We have digital assets of our own that we've created that people can access. Um, and we really are kind of the one-stop shop for the knowledge on how to answer your historical question about Clark County. Wow. <laughs> and that's you just our exhibits. We do all much other stuff too. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you, you really do make Vancouver cool. This was so much more. And uh, David is a musician, so I'm sure that's very exciting for you. Well, uh, yeah. So uh, right before the pandemic hit, <clears throat> Daria and I had this conversation about getting a camera uh, and going around to the, and recording snippets of all the music happening in Clark County, there's a huge music scene out, out here in Clark County, including open mics and then also, you know, uh, professional performers that come through and stuff. 
but I, I just love the vi vitality and the vibrance of the music community and and the open mics you get to see such incredible talent even I mean some pr from professionals all the way to you know just great intermediate level amateurs that are playing and singing their hearts out and stuff um, so uh, hopefully that'll be able to happen <laughs> after yeah. Yeah. This Delta wave comes through, we can get out into the community again and do that. So, Brad, tell us, I know that, I uh, believe that you are actually curating the C-TRAN exhibit on um, transportation in uh, Clark County. T tell us about that. So that was a, a really fun project. We were able to work with C-TRAN, and this is actually a part of a broader effort that we are working on um, you know, here at the museum, because if, if folks don't know, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. We're not a county agency. A lot of people, since we have Clark County in our name, think we're we're a government entity. We do get a portion of funding based on a contract with the county, but it only covers about 10 to 15 percent of what we operate on. So what we've started to do is to say, well, we're a certain group of people with a certain set of skills. Why don't we start using these to help community partners and entities celebrate important moments, but at the same time, bring in revenue to the museum. And so that's exactly what that was. And we've done a couple of these with like the Vancouver Clinic, the Water Resource Center, and then CTRAN is the most recent uh, group that we've done this with. And so we reached out to him and said, hey, you're, you're turning 40, can we do some kind of exhibit? And CTRAN was amazing. They, 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 you know, recognized what we could do, fully trusted us and let us really, um, kind of have that stakeholder conversation, review the materials they provided us, and then really let us examine uh, the story pretty pretty thoroughly. And so mm. that was really interesting. And what was funny about the timing of that is we're also doing nominations to the Heritage Register, which is another revenue generating um, service that we're doing. And we actually nominated what was called the Du Bois uh, Motor Company building so we were exploring the Du Bois Motor Company building at the same time we were doing the C-TRAN and those actually ended up dovetailing into each other because we wanted to give in the history of C-TRAN a little bit of context before C-TRAN because obviously everything that happens before feeds into what happens you know, now. And you know, we examined uh, the streetcar system during that time, you know, kind of did a brief overview of that. And, and I, I have to give a plug to another historian and also a fellow uh, ex-executive director, David Fries, uh, who used to run the Cowlitz County Museum, if anyone knows him at all. He actually wrote his dissertation from Portland State University on the Vancouver streetcar system. So if you go into PDX Scholar, you can read that. So it's, it's an incredibly thorough uh, piece. And really he talks about the rise of uh, the streetcar system in the the you know late 19th century in Vancouver, and it kind of was doing its thing, and and it was a private mass transit system, and then that transitions over across into the early 20th century, but then that early system kind of in the the early 20th century and teens fizzles out, and what we noticed that dovetailed with the Du Bois Motor Company building was that that was the same time you started seeing automobile sales in Vancouver. And the original automobile sales in Vancouver were really like, it was, uh, it was like cars plus bikes plus sporting goods shops. It was these shops that had kind of these mixtures of different things and then eventually evolved into like a Dodge dealership or a Ford dealership in, you know, by the late teens into the 20s. And it was around that same time that the streetcar system kind of tried to revive again. And then it eventually, again, it was a private mass transit system. It kind of failed. And what we can tell from the evidence that we have in David's work is that we think it was probably tied a lot to like real estate ideas of like delivering people out on those streetcars to places where people were speculating on land or wanted to have land sold for housing and developments. And you see a lot of that Northern Vancouver section, you know, growing in that early 20th century into the, the 1920s. And then once, you know, that land speculation and that real estate was kind of done, well, just getting people with fares onto the streetcar wasn't making these, you know, individuals in a private business a profit. And so it just kind of falter, falters from there. And then that's when you start to see bus mass transit. Mm -hmm. And I think people don't realize like we, we have our public transit today. And that was what we did when we explored C-TRAN is that really it's not until the late 70s and then officially in the early 80s 
that you get a really solid public transportation system all the way up through the late 60s into the early 70s. It's all a private system. And so, you know, the, the routes are changing. And I know people say routes change today, but, you know, the routes were changing, the fares were changing, there was disputes with, you know, labor, and there was all kinds of things putting pressure on the private business uh, owners of the transit system and they'd go to city council because they had a franchise through the city council and they'd just say yeah well we can't make money off this so we're going to change this route or we can't do this so we're going to change that and really it was with the advent of ctran that you finally see in the diversi uh, diversification of the services you saw paratransit dial a ride things like that and then more considerations being focused on what's the need of the public as opposed to you know this mass transportation system that's like well we got to make this pencil for this to continue to work and so it was incredible to see that divide and that does start with the vancouver bus company when the city takes that over i think in the 70s when that was and then finally transitions when state laws were passed in the 80s to CTRAN that we have today. And, you know, it's it's a pretty impressive transportation system. I mean, you look at from the start going through, it has been very really responsive over time uh, to a lot of the needs of the community. When you, I think, juxtapose it against that early mass transit private version of it. Hmm. It's interesting that uh, we now call that micro mobility that when I, I had no idea that when they first started, they were doing bicycles and trolleys and all these because what's old is new again we're trying to go back to get to this this concept of micro mobility so when you're when you're looking as a as a student of history um and you're looking at all of these uh, rapid changes uh, that that are happening what what do you see want to happen maybe talk about what you think we were doing right and what we could do better in in, in terms of our growth and and looking towards the future here a fast moving future <laughs> you know <laughs> and you can use that <laughs> <laughs> it, tr it truly is a fast moving future and i think you know you see with each decade and each generation it seems things accelerate and happen um quite a bit faster and you know what i think is important is to do surveys like we did i think you know ctran uh and that whole public transportation review that we did really has changed my perspective on, you know, how we can kind of go forward as we grow, because I've seen, you know, the paths of what we did as we talk about maybe, you know, if there's ever talk to roll back to privatize the transportation system, I'm like, well, I mean, look at the precedent of what we've done, you know, it, it didn't really work in that period or that time. Um, and I think just having really considerate growth um, I think you see a pattern in downtown Vancouver and across Clark County of kind of, you know, here's uh, a building and it looks, it's looked at as an obstacle as opposed to an asset uh, for, for our community. And we think, well, we can tear this down and build something new because that's cheaper right now, as opposed to, well, maybe if we invest in something and it's, it's more costly at the moment, over the long term, maintaining the character and the uniqueness of our community is actually a better economic plan. And, and one of the, the examples I can kind of give in especially downtown Vancouver is if you really look at downtown, it's a series of islands as opposed to a cohesive kind of flowing network of, of you know, the ability to be able to get commerce and people through because you kind of have waterfront island you have Esther Shore island you have lower main island you have uptown island because you have these big broad streets breaking up the walkability uh of the the downtown community and then you also have kind of this disjointed architecture at times of like a brand new structure like right next to something that was built like turn of the century so you you lose that feeling of a cohesive um, character and culture of a town when you kind of have this what looks like it was just you know plucked out of every decade uh, you know a little buffet of buildings um, and so I think as we go forward we obviously can't roll the clock back and and you know even as a historian and someone who cares about preservation you can't save everything you know there's things that do at with time need to go but I think being more mindful of the clusters of character when it comes to our architecture and our historical story being more mindful of that and realizing maybe that short-term turnaround 
isn't the best long-term plan because I mean, I meet with lots of groups today and people are saying like, well, how do we get people to downtown Vancouver? How do we explain what downtown Vancouver is? How do we talk about who we are in Vancouver? What's our character? Mm -hmm. What's our culture? And to me, I have to, and this is just, you know, kind of a guess, I have to guess it's because we didn't maintain the visible, physical, physical, tangible pieces that represented that continuity of story and stewardship and character in our city. And that's not trying to like denigrate or, 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 you know, call anyone out. It's like people are trying to do the best they can with what they have. In the 1960s, it was the drum, urban renewal, urban renewal, urban renewal. So like the city leaders are going, you know, over to the Midwest to like Cincinnati and they're going to conferences. And this is what everyone is being told up in Tacoma and Seattle and Olympia. Everyone's being told these things. And they're trying to say, okay, well, we have to respond to this. But in the end, it, it didn't really uh, necessarily do us the best service. I mean, it's funny. There's a photo uh, that we have uh, of the Slocum House in Esther Short Park right after urban renewal swept through and took out all the historic mansions. And I call it the loneliest house on the block photo mm -hmm. because if you look at a Sanborn map, which is in an old insurance map that you can find, and you look in the one we have is 1958, so it's before all of this swept through, you see all these houses are dotted. And you can't see what they look like, but you can see the footprints of all these homes. And then if you look at that photo, you see almost a, a bare Esther Short Park with the Slocum House in the corner where it had been moved to, and then just empty lots surrounding it. And, and to me, it's like probably in that moment, the city leaders said, well, this is a foundation for something new and greater, where now I look at this and say, well, what did we lose when we just kind of swept through and took out all of these historic homes that could have been some real character building assets, you know, could have been a nice historic district that related to a lot of the folks that people are very familiar with in the, the traditionally told Clark County or Vancouver story. Mm -hmm. So I think just being very mindful of that progress and the short-term gains versus, well, what can we learn already from the short-term, say, urban renewal period and match that up to today for future planning, mm -hmm. uh, if that all kind of makes sense. No, it makes sense completely. And it's like, you know, um, no, nobody visits the city because they, they want to see a, a sprawl intersection, you know, and, and I mean, being able to create an identity and uh, a culture and walkability is now an index for real estate. So, so hopefully we can really learn all of this and do the best we can with what we've got and not lose anymore. Cause that's so sad. Maybe too, what, what about a bus trolley to be able to connect these islands that you're talking about? You know, <laughs> I, I think some kind of system like that, some kind of loop system like a trolley or, or something of that nature that would be the thing that could help connect to these islands. Because if you get people from the waterfront, and, and I think for me, and again, these are all personal perspectives without data, which is the best kind of analysis, uh, <laughs> is, is I think people are very transactional in uh, downtown. So they'll go to the waterfront and they'll go to, you know, the one place in the waterfront and then the, they'll go home, right? Yeah. Or they'll go downtown, you know, to Lower Main. They'll go to the one coffee shop they want, and then they'll go home. And it's like kind of you get in their car. To, yeah, very singular. <laughs> but if you create a system that offers them the opportunity for a multiple site experience, which could be like that bus trolley, you know, circulator through downtown, I think you're going to have people saying, you know what, I'm at the waterfront. I'm walking around. Yeah, my car here. I still have like you know 40 minutes of parking. I'm gonna hop on and let's see what else there is down here. I think people are hungry for experience. You just have to create the port for them to enter to then go and find those experiences. And right now it's just, it's very visually and, and physically blocking to try to make it to those other islands. So I think, yeah, absolutely. And, and if that's something the community could get around and support, and for me, that's an amazing piece because we do tours of downtown Vancouver and all the other communities in Clark County. So, I mean, it's ready made for us to hop on and say, well, you know, while you're doing this, let us tell you when this building was built and who lived in it, you know, and, and talk about those experiences. You know, we could equate the newness of the, the waterfront and the excitement of going to like, you know, 
uh, Wild Fin when it when it opened up to people coming from across, across Clark County to the U.S. Bank building around 1911 and wanting to ride the elevator because there were so few elevators. They're like, and they, there's literally a news story of people coming down and just riding the elevator up and down. They're like, this is amazing. It's like, you know, uh, new things are, aren't new. You know, people get excited about new technology, new places. And, you know, we can match those stories up of the places that are new to people to what used to be new for folks and create that continuity of story, which again, that's what's so important in history is that continuity of story of telling people that folks have always experienced the same things you're experiencing just in a different way. And here's your connection to the past. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of, uh, I used to live in Oakland and San Francisco and, and uh, I didn't use, I, we actually didn't use a car most of the time there because of the trolley systems and the transportation systems and the very rapid transit going back and forth uh, through the tunnel. So uh, it, uh, and I love that the feeling of that trolley and you can just, well, I want to go, I'm here, I'm going to go down the waterfront, but then I want to go over to City Lights book where I can get on. The, so all these multiple sites you can just hop on and go to. And that idea is just brilliant. And let's make it happen here in Clark County. I, yeah. And, and Brad, you're the one to do it. Yeah. I mean, you know, the thing, <laughs> I, what I, I would love to know, like if you, if you could just envision this and you didn't have any restraints because I mean we now have a downtown association but having some kind of an umbrella organization that would encompass this connectivity with this identity this cultural place making awareness uh, how would you envision that hmm that's a really good question you know I, I mean I would envision it really again connecting from I think starting with the waterfront makes a lot of sense because you're going to have a mixture of people who both aren't from here and people are who are from here so you're going to be able to attract you know those two different groups it is a real focal point regardless of some folks maybe on main street feel a little left out because of the waterfront or that it is you know uh, causing them some strain but I think we, we you know if you see something that's causing you strain or, or that's, you know, you feel like is kind of, you know, taking some things away from you, figure out how to leverage that thing for your own benefit. Uh, that's, you know, always a good way to approach it. So, you know, getting down and starting there and then connecting people to shopping and dining on Lower Main first would be the first piece of doing that. Cause that's where we have like Firehouse Glass, we have Divine Consign, we have photographers, uh, we have, uh, there's the brand new one, Kindred, I've heard is amazing. I haven't had a chance to see them, but uh, I've heard they're incredible. They're right down in the Schofield building. And these are places that are great for us because they're, they're set in shop up in historic buildings that we know the stories about. So we can, again, create and connect that story uh, of those businesses in those buildings. And then from there, I think getting over to the reserve, showing people that Vancouver is so unique because it has a national park smack dab in the middle of an urban space, which I, I don't know, I've been to a couple of national parks. I don't think they're traditionally in the middle of, you know, urban centers. Uh, so that's a really unique thing, getting them to experience the four, experience Pearson, go down Officers Row, you know, as we, you know, hopefully start to see a revival of shopping and business and restaurants on Officers Row, connect them with those types of things. And again, this might be kind of an attrition process where like part of your group gets off on Main and that's where they stay. And then they pick up the circulator on the way back and part of your group gets off, you know, at Officers Row. And then from there, obviously bring them past our building and then into Uptown, um, you know, for all the experiences that you have up there that have been growing and developing. And then finally get them delivered back down, maybe into the Esther Short area. If there's festivals, there's concerts, there's evening, you know, films, uh, you know, and just create that that ability to be able to connect with those things. Have it running. One of the big keys would be having it running near and and dropping off near show times at the Kiggins. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not sure why we all just don't deliver people the dance front door all the time because. Yeah, yeah. One of the things I always have to comment on is just because that building's on the national register, it's it's not on the county register um, as far as and it's not on the state as far as I'm aware. Just because it's on the national register doesn't mean that if Dan ends up not being able to continue to operate that, that someone else couldn't come in and say, you know what, let's just take this all down and do condos. There's nothing necessarily stopping them other than you know maybe some you know tax. Uh, 
you know, loss that they would have to do or, or anything of that nature. I think people think that there's some kind of law baked into preservation and national registers and state registers and county registers that isn't there. You know, it doesn't mean we can't lose these places. So one of the key things that we have to do as stewards is we need to patronize places that have good business owners in historic buildings that we don't want to lose. Because if those places go dark and they lose their life, I mean, it's over, game over. You, you, yeah. you Eventually, once you get so far down the line with someone wanting to do something, you just don't have any choices. And no matter how much you want to try and flail and be mad and be indignant about it, you're not going to change that economic decision to lose, destroy, or change a historic place or site. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this I think it's so important to support local. And, and I think that a lot of times people like, for example, I've heard in the next door and people are so upset about a, a, a series of beautiful, you know, big trees that yeah. are, are going to get cut down, but they put up the little notice and you need to speak up before when you have that opportunity for public testimony. And so in a sense, that's just what you're saying. It's like, we need, we need to we need to go to these local places that we value now because we can't presume that the good guys are going to win or that, or that the, or that the best outcome will prevail. Yeah. yeah with and, the, I just wanted to put a, uh, talk about his, do you have a program called history on tap that's connected to the Kagan's? We do. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about that after your comment there? Just to, I want to make sure we talk about that. Yeah, and just to cap off on kind of the vision for, um, for say that that circulator trolley, kind of the, I, I explained the physical and obviously the amenity of us being able to provide both a historic tour and then also talking. You know, we train our tour guides for our tours to also talk about the businesses to say, mm -hmm. well, hey, you know, this is where Loop Key Florist used to be, but she also should go get some really awesome cans from Tap Union because I mean they're a great bottle shop. Um, but the other thing too that's really important for me is that other partners would be invested and a part of it um, so that there isn't just one entity running it. So the Vancouver Downtown Association, Uptown Village Association, the Chamber, the Museum, you know, all the other organizations that could be involved in these things, the city, um, that we all partner in and work together and kind of leave, you know, check the ego at the door and say, what's best for Vancouver as opposed to what's best for the museum. Mm -hmm. And we have um, Artstra now. So they're moving forward with, you know, Artstra, which is very exciting. And that's, yeah. that's going to be a, a place of art and making art and showing art. And one thing before we switch over, I would just like to add on this connector trolley system. Love it, Brad, I love it. We have to make this happen. I would add that we should do fourth plane. Because Fourth Plain is, you probably know this better than I do, that's the most international neighborhood that we have that's part of the city. And yep. we have some very beloved restaurants um, from many cultures there. And people talk about Thai Little Home and it doesn't matter how far away they've moved. If they come back to Vancouver, they're they're sure to show up there. So, and and that's not walkable. So having that, that uh, mm -hmm. trolley system take you around would be perfect. And we all know that this is why restaurant owners put their restaurants right next to each other because the more people go out to eat, the more they go out to eat. Yep. It's that virtuous cycle. And, and if I can add on to the fourth plane piece, we actually started with um, Carbon, Carbon McKibben uh, about a year and a half ago or so um, and Sydney Johnson over at Fourth Plane Forward on working on a exhibit about the growth of the Fourth Plane International District. Uh, so we're actually right now in the process of going through a lot of the material. We worked with a Portland State, or not Portland State, a WCU Vancouver uh, public history class and a lot of the students gathered a bunch of the material. They did some interviews. We worked with uh, Professor Donna Sinclair um, on that project too. And so all of these groups have come together and we are actually working to set up uh, an exhibit that will talk about the growth, and it's going to be a digital one that we'll do online, the growth of that district. But in turn, once you do something like that, then it starts to let you tell the physical story that's laid out. So again, with the trolley, once we have this exhibit, we're able to also go back and say, well, here's the story of this section, and here's the story of this building, and here's the history of that. So it would easily, as we work to gain that information and work with the community on the community's terms to tell that story, we're going to be able to then also incorporate it into broader things like like the trolley and other stuff. I love that. It's like it's like a it's a it's a reaching embrace. Yep. 
So history on tap. Uh, so history on tap uh, basically started, the ideas seed was planted in uh, Scott Hewitt and Sue Peabody's backyard during a uh, annual summer barbecue a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan Wyatt and I have known each other for quite a while. We're, we're friends. And Dan was, you know, there having a beer and I was having a beer and Dan walks over and says, you know, we do comedy on tap. We do science on tap. Yep. You want to do history on tap? <laughs> 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 and there it was that yeah. was the birth of history on tap and uh, -huh. uh what we did is you know we're, we're a historical museum i mean thinking you know if you think in traditional terms of someone thinking of a historical museum having a 300 and what 50 capacity theater on a thursday night to come talk about history people thought we were pretty crazy uh, cause you know, they're, they're not the thing people are going to come out for that. And so we started the program intentionally with some kind of, you know, to local topics that we thought would really hit very well. We did some ghost stories. We did some brewing history. Um, we hi highlighted Pat Gelata and some of the stories that she had done. Um, and then we were a local with, historian, right? Pat Gelata, yeah, local historian. She's, yeah. She's written a number of books. Yeah. Yep. So we had her come out and talk about some of the stuff that she did. Um, we did a second brewing one. Uh, you know, we, we kind of did part one and then part two. Uh, and we did that very intentionally to hit on very popular things that we knew were kind of already, you know, permeating through the, the culture of Clark County. Um, and what was great about that was we were able to establish a solid program. Like our first one with the beer, it was like, you know, standing room only in that 300, you know, person theater, it was packed. And then the subsequent ones were around 150, 200 people, which is about three quarters or uh, half to three quarters of the theater filled, which is great for kind of a public history, local program. Um, and the pandemic has, has obviously shifted our ability to continue to grow that specific piece, but we, we decided to continue with the plan that we had initially, regardless of the pandemic. So we started local, which kind of started to match our speaker series that we do once a month. We do the CCHM speaker series once a month, which is a very locally focused talk. And the, the idea was that eventually History on Tap should evolve in seasons three and four to more regional and national history. And so what happens is, is that our speaker series is your Clark County history. This is our local, we're gonna talk about that. And it's more of an intimate setting. It's usually done at the museum or other places that we can get to around the county. And then history and taps are larger, more broad, just delivering history. Cause we don't necessarily at the museum have to deliver you just Clark County history. We can also be kind of your one-stop shop for engagement with history period that live in Southwest Washington. And so we did, we transitioned this last year um, to doing more of those, those broad topics. So we had um, Peter Bogue, who's a WCU Vancouver come in and talk about uh, transgender in the West uh, history of that. And then we recently had um, a woman from one of the, the regional indigenous nations talking about a topic related to you know, that community mm. um, and just really broadening these things out. And then we still do ghost stories. So our next one is still gonna be ghost stories uh, in October, but really looking forward, you know, we wanna continue to build the program up to a point where it's regional, national, you know, maybe we bring in the premier national speaker to Vancouver for, you know, each year through the History on Tap program. We're looking towards Humanities Washington. I'm a, I'm a trustee on Humanities Washington for a number of years um, now, and we're looking to the Speakers Bureau to start bringing those statewide speakers in on talking on broad, um, you know, general statewide topics. And it's been fun to really transition the program to that. And, you know, it's great. Beer is a huge attractor. The Kiggins is an amazing theater and a beautiful building to come and, and watch a show at. And we really have some interesting topics that we're able to bring. And so now the two programs, Speaker Series and History on Tap, have, have been distinguished from each other, where um, before they were still a little bit overlapping. But that was our organic plan to grow it over the couple of years. And we're hoping once we can fully get back into the Kiggins, we're going to be seeing, you know, that, you know, 150 to 250 uh, person attendance again. And just so that everyone knows, 
we see history on tap as two parts of our mission. One part of our mission is to bring this history programming to the community and facilitate that because we're, you know, the folks that know kind of the, the people and the topics to bring. But two, it's a preservation effort because if we can bring people into the Kiggins and we can get dollars through the door, that helps uh, continue to build what Dan Wyatt can do over the Kiggins to continue to maintain his business. So we don't take any of the admission sales, uh, we raise sponsorship, which then we pay uh, Wager Audio to be able to do um, the audio for that night and to make sure all the sound and lights are every and everything are good. We don't take money from the Kiggins for that event because we see that as a preservation effort to try to deliver as many dollars to Dan as possible. That's lovely. Brilliant idea. Brilliant. There's so many exciting things that you are doing and that you're <laughs> deeply involved with in terms of culture, preservation, identity. So what, what's exciting you out of all of that? What's, what's exciting you the most and what's next for you, Brad? Oh, wow. That's a good question. I mean, I, it, it's, it's, it's like your children. It's so hard to decide, <laughs> uh, you know, what, what is the most exciting thing? I think um, there, there are two things that are, are very exciting for me. One is something that we started last year, which we actually just recently, uh, Scott Hewitt from the Columbian came in and did an article about uh, kind of in a retrospective as we're continuing to progress through an effort, which is our capture the moment collection that we're working on, uh, which it's kind of funny. We, we are very quick at turning things around and kind of being on top of things. And I think this one, we were so fast. We, we beat everybody to the punch. Uh, and so we're now kind of trailing on this project to start seeing the benefit come back to the museum. And basically it's a digital collection that people can submit to online without any necessary filter from the museum. They can submit photos, they can submit videos, writing, anything digital that they can submit, they can submit to our Capture the Moment collection. And it's all about capturing the moment. And really the clock starts 18 months ago and anything that's happened in life uh, from that point continuing on forward is eligible. So, you know, it can How be- How do people do that? So they can go to our, our website, uh, cchmuseum.org, and in the search bar, they can type in capture the moment, um, and they're able to get to that. It's also on our social media. You can see kind of posted in different places. And, you know, really, it's an open submission. You can submit from all the different types of events and, and things that are happening in our society are all eligible for a submission. And really, what we want to do is people to be reflective in the moment and say, here is something that's important to me that I want to write a little about because you give a description and I want to provide some physical piece uh, or digital piece for you to be able to document that. And then- So like a photograph or a, or a video? A photograph, a video, a voice recording, uh, digital writing, digital art. I mean, anything that you can submit digitally, uh, we would love to have. And the plan is as we get, further in time I used to say is the pandemic ends but that tends to not be something that we don't say so much anymore um we're gonna we're gonna collect all these things and do a retrospective in one of our galleries and do a physical retrospective plus a digital one of this that is going to be we, we have a pretty neat plan uh for it you'll, you'll be very interested once we we start to execute it how it's gonna it's gonna look it's I think it's going to be one of the most inventive things that we've done. And so I'm really excited. And I'm not trying to give away too much for my uh, public historian who's going to be putting that exhibit together. Um, so I'm really excited about that. And then I'm excited about the slate of exhibits that we have coming up in the future. So we're working with the Vancouver NAACP. Uh, they have a big anniversary coming up in the next couple of years. So we're going to be doing an exhibit on that. Uh, the 200th anniversary of Fort Vancouver. Uh, Hudson's Bay Fort Vancouver is coming up in a number of years we're going to be doing an exhibit on that um that one we're calling echoes of Fort Vancouver and the goal for us is to because we we always want to be careful and, and and caring for our historical partners in the community and, and and we all have to admit it's the NPS's birthday uh the Fort Vancouver NPS's birthday and so we should all support them and make sure that their vision is 
you know, scene down at Fort Vancouver. So what we're going to do is let them tell the Fort Vancouver story, but we're going to pick up at the end of that story and say, how has the repercussions or the impact of Hudson's Bay Fort Vancouver expressed itself going all the way through today? You know, I mean, like Mill Plain, the roads that we have, the agriculture that we have, lots of things that we interact with are all results of Hudson's Bay, Fort Vancouver. And so we're going to pick up that later narrative and go all the way through that thread. So I'm excited about that. Um, we, we got one that's going to be connected to the 250th anniversary uh, of the Declaration of Independence uh, coming up. Uh, so all of those types of things, uh, you know, in number of years that are coming up that we're going to be able to do. So I'm, I'm excited about those exhibits and those projects. Uh, that we're going to be able to, to do. And then just thinking the now is just getting back to more familiar uh, programming, you know, in-person, in-person walking tours, and then looking at all of the digital assets that we built. Because we built so much video editing knowledge and, and video broadcast knowledge and digital outreach knowledge is then looking at those things we did traditionally and saying, how can we enhance these with the, the digital pieces that we have learned and created and do them elegantly within the system, as opposed to, I think sometimes digital is kind of like a hammer over the head. Uh, it just gets used because we can use it. But I think we want to be thoughtful in how we pair that up with our hopefully going back to in-person, on-site, on, you know, at other sites, programming across uh, Clark County. Plus, you're in that beautiful Carnegie building, and you're in that gorgeous little historical building there. Yeah. So you're going to be taking all of these national issues and showing the local importance and doing it in a multimedia fashion. Yeah, that's really, really the goal is to weave, you know, from the most personal story in Clark County to the, you know, biggest changes in our nation and have conversations with the community about what that means for both the local stakeholders uh, and, you know, in context to the broader national story. Oh, it's so wonderful and so cool. So what about volunteers? Do you need volunteers and how, do, how would people get involved? Yeah, absolutely. We definitely need volunteers. Um, you know, we're just getting the building back up and running since about April, I think is when we opened back up. So you know, we're trying to, to figure that out. And we actually restructured the organization during the pandemic. Um, we had had an administrative position for a decade plus. We ended up changing that position to a public historian position. So the museum is, is designed differently by the staff now, because now we have, you know, the collections manager position, which is our preservation and manages the objects, make sure the bond between a physical object and the story are, are kept together and not lost and that's their primary job. Then we have our public historian who then takes those physical objects and those stories and then expresses them in exhibits and interpretation and research. And then we have our programs and marketing manager who then takes all of this stuff and says, hey, look how cool this is. You should come out and check this out in relation to a program or an event or you know, use social media posts and other things to broadcast that. And then you got good old money man here uh, <laughs> and administrator, which is fundraiser and making sure the wheels stay on the organization. Um, and so we definitely need volunteers for all four of those quadrants uh, that we're working in. Um, and they can really just go to our site, cchmuseum.org, and there's a get involved button right on the front page. You click on that and that lets you do three things. It'll let you either become a member if you're not, which we need investment to be able to continue. It'll let you volunteer and it'll also connect you with uh, the programs and things that we're doing. Cause that's what we always ask people to do is three things. You can, you know, invest your time, which is coming to the museum, uh, going to a program, going to an event, invest your talent, uh, which is coming and volunteering. And, and, you know, we're very specialized as a volunteer organizations, you know, so we, get people into very special positions because you know we have very particular jobs that we have to do related to historical interpretation research and all that so we provide training for that um or you know invest your you know funding uh, for the treasure. organization your treasure <laughs> so you have your, your alliteration <laughs> how much does it cost to be a member you know an individual membership is about as much as it costs to go out for one dinner uh which is about forty dollars 
and that covers us for the whole year and what that does is that gets you access to our museum and a lot of our events a lot of our programs and discounts on other things and then a family membership is just sixty dollars and that gets you four passes and we don't you know we don't say oh do you live together or this and that i mean we just want you to bring people in so it really gets you four passes your friends or your family you know there's there's all kinds of people that you can bring in uh, and then the other one that I mentioned is our um, associate, which is our $100 level. And that one gets you a national reciprocal benefit. So you can visit um, at the same benefit level about 45 museums from Salem to Seattle. Oh, wow. uh, so if you're going to go traveling, you have all these uh, different museums. We're in a little bit of a hole right here. There's not a ton right locally, but if you're going to go between Salem and Seattle, there's about 45 museums that you can visit and you can enter them for free because you have your membership benefit from us, um, which is really neat. And again, all of these are what allow things like our women's history exhibit, like our history on tap event, like our future exhibits that we're gonna do. It's really all through that investment. And the more people that become members, the, the stronger uh, we become as an organization because we have those 40, 60, $100 you know, uh, donors as members in mass, then we're able to get out and spread our capacity to, you know, further across Clark County. And that's, you know, it's through memberships that we've been able to establish our Ridgefield walking tour, our battleground walking tour, our Camas walking tour, uh, Old City Cemetery. It's that expansion is a direct result of watching our membership grow and having those small, you know, to medium sized dollar donors helping us uh, mm -hmm. continue to, uh, you know, keep the lights on. So I want to be aware of your time. It's uh, just a little bit after 11. Uh, any last uh, thing you want to say uh, and want community members to know about the Historical Society? You know, I think just in the final thing I'd want to just remind people is that our mission at the museum, we, we kind of framed it differently a couple of years ago because normally you hear, hear a museum say, uh, collect, interpret, and preserve. Uh, things and we said you know that's that's true that's what we're doing but we want to see it more as an active experience that the community is a part of mm -hmm. so we changed those to say we gather save and share the pieces and memories of Clark County history mm -hmm. and the we is doing a lot of work because the we is is you and me and everybody because when I walk in the building here like me you know I have a key and a code and I can have access to this place because I'm an employee here but I don't own a single thing in this place. What I'm doing is I'm stewarding all of the things that are yours in the community. And we're telling the stories that are yours in this community. And so it's an active process. And this is a place for your memories to be uh, gathered, saved, and shared for future generations. And so the more people that engage with us, the more support we can garner to do that, the stronger we can become at saving these memories that of our community. And if we can do that, then all the things that we work for in our lives, all the passions that we have, all the initiatives that we're trying to get done, all the things that we build in our lives can be better understood. Mm. And if they're better understood, then people can help carry those forward or learn from our mistakes. Like I, I, I am not shy. If I've made mistakes in my life and someone could go back and say, you know what, I'm not going to do what dummy did. <laughs> that's awesome. I I'm happy about that because that's what a good citizen and a good steward is all about. It's not about, am I aggrandized when I'm dead and gone? It's, did I do something that made the world better for those who come after me? Um, and so that's what we're here to do is to be responsive and stewards of your stories, of your things. Um, and we just want you to be a part of it. So reach out and get involved because that's what we're here for. Thank you so much, Beverly. Thank you. That is so beautiful. Thank you for your, your beautiful, positive, powerful, inclusive work. You certainly make Vancouver cool. Say goodbye, because we're going to bring you back. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> Bye and for I'll now. Down, and I'll be down in science on tap for sure. Um, history uh, on tap. Huh? History, history on tap. On tap. <laughs> yeah. Science on tap, history on tap, and all. And then just, uh, and just beer. What I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> just <a beer>. right. <laughs>
there's the history of science, right? Yeah, on tap. So uh, thank you. Uh, thank you again for coming to Cool Coob. And remember people to stay cool and curious. And the, the historical society, the museum is a great place to start. Bye, everybody. Thank Say you. goodbye, Bye. Brad, but you're coming back. Bye. <laughs>